Um, again, my name is Erin Corcoran. I'm the executive director here at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies and also serving as the acting director this year while Ashra Kaufman is on leave. I'm just going to briefly introduce our session two, which is entitled, Does the Evidence Lead to Enhanced Utility for International Law and Greater Respect of, for Human Rights, which is sort of the framing question that this panel is going to take up in the context of Bob's new book. And again, just a, a, a real shout out to our PhD students. Um, this uh, session is being uh, moderated and organized by Diana Isabel Guzia Gomez, who's pursuing her PhD in political science and peace studies here at the University of Notre Dame. She's um, obviously affiliated with us here at the Kroc Institute, as well as the Kellogg Institute for International Studies and the Violence and Transitional Justice Lab. And her research agenda involves rural poor mobilization of land reform, economic redistribution and civil war, political settlements, transitional justice, and constitution making. So I'm going to turn the panel panel and session over to her to take over. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Erin. Can you hear me clearly? OK. So it is my pleasure to serve as a moderator for our second session that is titled, Does the Evidence Lead to Enhanced Utility for International Law and Greater Respect for Human Rights? And let me introduce our distinguished speakers to the audience. First, we have today with us Iziz Nusair, who is an Associate Professor of International Studies and Women's and Gender Studies at Denison University. She's the co-editor with Rhoda Kananin of Displaced at Home, Ethnicity and Gender Among Palestinians in Israel, and translator of Ever Since I Did Not Die by Rami Al-Ashik. Iziz is the co-writer director with Laila Farah of Weaving the Maps, Tales of Survival and Resistance. Her research focuses on Iraqi women refugees in Jordan and the USA, Palestinian and Syrian refugees in Germany, and Syrian TV drama post-2011. Welcome, is this. We also have with us Raul Campuzano, who is a professor of international environmental law. He is a lawyer from Universidad de Chile, and he holds a Master of Arts in International Peace Studies from the University of Notre Dame, and a Master of Laws from University of Leiden. Raul is Director of Graduate Students and Academic Director of Master's Program on Environmental Law at Universidad del Desarrollo in Santiago de Chile. Welcome, Raul. And we have over Zoom Javier Aguirre, who is a Senior Coordinator at the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court he holds a Master of Arts in International Peace Studies from the University of Notre Dame. Xavier worked at the Office of the Prosecutor of the United Nations International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and then joined the International Criminal Court in 2004 with the first team that set up the Office of the Prosecutor. He has worked in the investigation of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes in multiple situations around the world for the last 25 years. He has also lectured in a number of universities and training programs with national and international institutions, and you can find his books and articles in his academia.edu website. Welcome all the speakers, and thank you for joining us in this panel today. So we will have each speaker speak around five to seven minutes. They will briefly discuss and comment on Professor Johansson's book uh, from the work experience and around the following question that might trigger our conversation later. Will an enhanced role for international law or increased compliance with basic human rights increase the prospects for peace? So this is our prompt question and I may turn over ISIS. You have five, seven minutes. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. Um, thank you, and if I may refer to Professor Johansson as Bob, because this is how we refer to you. Um, I graduated in 94, and reading the book for the last few days has been very interesting in terms of bringing me back 29 years ago to thinking about the questions we used to raise in our classes and the papers we wrote. And, um, and these are questions I've been thinking about, and actually it's been quite moving, thinking about throughout these um, three decades. And um, I've been thinking also about how they informed my own work, my own research, my own, I consider myself to be an activist scholar uh, in terms of the commitments to rights, to justice, to creating a world that um, 
everyone benefits from its resources. So <laughs> it's a bit moving, um, but I'll try to go through the notes I have. Uh, especially that um, the book for me also raised questions uh, and tensions in regard to where the evidence leads. Um, the evidence leads us to lots of knowledge, um, lots of ways of thinking differently about issues that we um, engage with on a daily basis. Uh, but I would say the practice does not um, lead to maybe the solutions we want. So part of that tension that I'd like to propose today relates to some of the examples I would bring up from my own work um, and also um, linkages uh, between especially the personal and if we want to say the political or the private and the public and how are we to, if we are to reimagine a different world or a different way of doing politics, um, how are we to do that? So I'll just be very brief. Um, I think the, the book um, raises important questions and prompts us to think critically about power about hierarchies, about privilege, about margin center, uh, and about systems of inclusion and exclusion. And one thing I really appreciated is uh, Bob's emphasis on these systems aren't static, they're not to be taken for granted, they're not natural by any means, so thinking about the constructed nature of these systems um, is important to help us think about ways of either dismantling it, creating alternatives, um, rebuilding whatever way we want to give to it. And that's the part I want to focus on, and I hope our discussion today will focus on it. Um, this book connects um, with questions I raised, like I said, in my own teaching and research that focus on um, my, um, and Bob probably remembers, uh, in class we always, um, when I came in 93, 94, it was my first time in the United States. I came for the master's program, and um, I think dealing with um, a new culture, um, the cultural shock, and having those questions in class prompted us constantly to rethink um, our locations, uh, what we bring to the program, um, the experiences. Um, myself is Palestinian uh, from Nazareth, and um, the commitments and relations, like Bina said, to these many different places. So um, in my own work, starting from 93, 94, and I still have the two books that were assigned uh, in regard to feminist um, analysis, um, I view um, these questions very much from a feminist, from an intersectional, and from a queer perspective. Uh, that relates to thinking about them uh, in terms of intersectionality, the connection between race, class, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, um, uh, citizenship, if we want to think about cosmopolitan citizenship um, uh, in the discussion, uh, thinking in particular about constructions of masculinity, uh, when we think about systems of war or political systems in general, we can't, um, I think, do that without really taking gender seriously, thinking about binaries um, and the connections between uh, war and peace. Uh, is one um, the opposite of the other, cancels the other, what are the continuums, the connections between them, especially if we are to think about private public connections um, and personal political ones as well. Um, in, in the work that I'll talk about in a second, um, I focus a lot on um, three continuums actually in particular. One, uh, and that's uh, maybe my first question to Bob, is legacies of colonialism and where are we uh, in regard to these questions today. Um, the second relates to continuums of violence, uh, whether in the private and the public and the connections between them. And the third is one I've been grappling with a lot for the last, um, I would say, two decades in regard to continuums of displacement. I've been working with um, refugees um, uh, on questions of forced displacement, uh, and I raised lots of questions because many of the people I worked with, um, displacement or forced displacement for them wasn't a question of, I just moved to a new place. It could be a decade of displacement um, that I emphasize in my own work. And of course, I very much appreciated also um, the emphasis on the, on the connection with power and militarization um, and um, mil the military industrial complex. And there was a part uh, in the book where um, Bob referenced uh, um, the connection between the DOD and the uh, DOS and who's actually really making the politics in regard to, uh, if we want to focus in particular about the um, invasion of Iraq. Um, one of the main questions raised in the book relates to how um, to create a just society and sustainable peace. And these are the questions that guide my work and also <coughs> my living. It discusses the indivisibility of rights 
uh, within a context of institutional and personal change. And again, I really appreciated the connection between the two because I don't think we can um, talk about any of these issues without linking the two. Um, unfortunately, we all benefit one way or another from these unjust systems, from the privileges that we have, whether by being where we are um, in our lives, being here, um, uh, benefiting from systems of um, exploitation, even if we're aware of them. Um, and the question is, what are we doing to, to address that? How are we to reimagine a different way of living uh, our lives while changing these systems and institutions? And how are we to uh, build, reform, create alternatives and new institutions? One thing about the book I really uh, also appreciate it, it gives us space to imagine. It provides lots of knowledge. Um, it, it makes connections between um, different sources also of, of knowledge building and theoretical frameworks. And it gets us to think or reimagine different ways of doing politics, um, different ways of imagining the nation state, of thinking about sovereignty. Um, and, and for that, I really uh, want to pose the second question um, in, in this presentation in regard to our points of reference, uh, to Western li li liberal thought um, that informs many of the human rights, whether we want it or not, um, doctrines that uh, we work with, um, the Eurocentric, American-centric ways of thinking, and again, and ways of living, I would say, and now with technology, um, inform uh, many of the uh, decisions and styles of, of living that we have. Uh, and in regard to technology, it's actually really interesting to think of how technology could be used to advance human rights because of the spread of communication, um, appeal to the new generation, and different ways of maybe thinking and conceptualizing human rights in order to make those connections that uh, Bob talks about in the book. Also, the book does a great job in thinking about the long-term vision um, and about implementation. But the third question I will pose, um, and I don't know how much time I have. One minute. Um, one minute, OK. Is can we afford? What kind of time frame do we have? And can we afford um, you know, with environmental um, degradation, um, impact on our lives we've seen with, uh, with COVID? I mean, it showed very much the connection between the different parts of the world and um, your theory about the nation state system that the disease didn't stop at certain borders, right? It, it was really um, a collective, um, and it impacted all of us uh, in the whole world in different ways. So the question is, how are we to um, think about these time frames? Uh, what are the pressing issues? Um, and what could be done about it? Uh, <clears throat> thinking about human secu security within a context also of um, global security is really important. And making it um, connected to national security is crucially important. Um, to thinking about the reframing uh, and thinking about these time frames uh, in a, an urgent and pressing manner. Um, just briefly about the depressing part of my own research, um, I've been actually since I graduated from Notre Dame, I got my PhD in women and gender studies, uh, and I wrote my dissertation on three generations of Palestinian women in Israel. Uh, when the pictures of torture at Abu Ghraib came out, I actually was um, very troubled by what I saw. <laughs> Not that I didn't expect torture to take place, but the way this torture was sexualized, racialized, and gendered um, got me thinking because these are the tools I work with in my own analysis. So I started the project of working with um, Iraqi women refugees in Jordan and the United States. Um, this is a project I started in 2007, and I'm still working on it. Um, I'm writing actually a book um, um, at the moment on that topic, thinking about the devastation, the destruction of the infrastructure, the effect it had on people's lives, the trauma people carry, and thinking about accountability, who's to be held accountable when we think about that, and how are we to use the human rights system to do that. Um, the second project is about um, the refugees that came from Syria, um, I uh, started interviewing them, and all my work focuses on narrative analysis in Syria, and these include both Syrian and Palestinian, because in both the Iraqi project and the Syrian project, Palestinians were displaced in these two contexts for the second time, because they couldn't live in those countries anymore, and they had to, to move to either Jordan and the US in the case of Iraq, and to Germany in the case of uh, Palestinians. So thinking about those questions within my own work, um, I would say the devastating impact and the lack of accountability are pressing. Um, there's also time in terms of generation after generation. If we look at Iraq, they're losing um, 
ability to live a um, <coughs> dignified life, at least with basic uh, human rights of um, right to education, right to, um, to food, right to, um, to health, etc. So how are we um, to think about rights within a context of this constant war? And if we think about the Middle East, actually, there hasn't been hardly, except for the Gulf and Israel, which are United States product of um, alliances, uh, most of the region, I would say, is in ruins because of these wars. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isis. So now we turn to Raul. The floor is yours. Good morning. I'd like to thank Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies and Kuch School of Global Affairs for inviting me to this academic event and allowing me the joy of being with Professor Robert Johansson after more than 30 years of being his student. Does the evidence lead to enhanced utility for international law and greater respect for human rights? I'd like to address the question focusing on Bob's proposals regarding environmental policies. And let me tell you a story to begin with. It goes like this. I quote, our own experiences have brought us to the realization that environmental issues are inseparable from issues of economic development, human rights, and other challenges to peace about which we express concern. We believe that a number of policy steps of a short and long range nature can be simultaneously taken to begin to correct the deteriorating and peace threatening environmental situation. As a guiding value, we aim for a harmonic coexistence of human beings and nature, and we recognize that to translate this to policy demands a major reconsideration of the role of human beings in nature." Close quotation. This was written in June 1989. The title of the text is Towards a Just World, a statement for the 21st century. The authors were the 1988-1989 international scholars of the Institute for International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame. A lot of water has passed under the bridge since then. Tremendous global efforts have been undertaken to prioritize environmental policy and laws with the aim of affecting change to the role of human beings in nature. Consider such landmarks environmental summits as Rio 1992, Kyoto, 1997, Johannesburg, 2001, Rio Plus 20, 2012, and Paris, 2015, to mention just a few. So the 88-89 the group wrote its statement at an early stage of the modern history of global environmental policy and law. And yet, we had an intuition then. And this intuition was taking form in the classrooms in the library, near the lakes, in Peace House. It was taking place in our endless discussions. Please keep in mind, there was a Soviet Union at the time, and we had, indeed, a couple of Soviets in the group. And Tiananmen Square happened during our time here. So it is a bit difficult to convey here and now the sort of world we lived in at that time. And let me tell you, we all had issues back home to deal with as well. In my case, there was a dictatorship at the time in Chile, a long one, but yet we had an intuition. It was within this world context that we attended Robert Johansson's class. And arising from those classes, things began to take their place, the right place. He taught us to ask questions. No wonder we are all keeping doing that now. In his book, Johansen writes, quote, all of us will need to change some of our thinking and acting. No one has all the answers, but by listening deeply and inclusively to one another, we together can find ways to end unnecessary suffering and secure the values of human dignity for future generations, end quote. The environment constitutes one of Johansson's concerns in his book. It was so back then in his class and it is now in his book, in which he proposes a number of policy actions regarding environmental challenges. First, 
U.S. environmental groups and the EPA can play a major role by seizing the opportunity to promote change through extensive public education demonstrating that environmental threats are huge and need to be taken seriously. Second, the need for an environmental security council. Third, the necessity to formulate comprehensive environmental treaty setting out of states' rights and responsibilities in environmental management. Fourth, the establishment of a UN Common Heritage Council. And fifth, the creation of a Green Grid Alliance, a bond between countries which excess solar energy potential and those with insufficient energy resources. Indulge me in proposing a couple more. And these are a question to Bob. How about an international environmental court? Uh, we all know that the International Court of Justice uh, is not prepared to deal with environmental issues. And, and there are several examples, don't have the time to go into, but they, they exist. And the ICC has not uh, environmental international crimes as part of its jurisdiction. Uh, therefore, neither one of the most, the two most important international court has environmental uh, expertise. How about an international environmental parliament? Uh, how about a United Nations Environmental Council including security concern, as Bob suggests, but also aiming way beyond that? It's not only a matter of, of security. Um, for instance, how about a world environmental policy maker? Um, finally, my proposal for thought and discussion. The question for this panel is, does the evidence lead to enhanced utility for international law and greater respect for human rights? The answer for this question goes way beyond my pay grade. <laughs> Nevertheless, I can attempt a suggestion regarding environmental protection as human right. Peace has proven to be elusive. Throughout history, we have tried many formulas to no avail. We live in a rich, plural, and diverse world. And let's rejoice, because the alternative is obscure and sad. However, this diversity comes with a price. We have not been able to agree basic ideological tenets. Ideologies gave us the turbulent 20th century, and ideologies seem to be resurfacing now. Nothing wrong with that, per se. But where shall we find common ground to enable us to embrace the task ahead, united as humankind? I'd like to suggest that the need to look to nature, to the planet, as a whole. I'd like to suggest that environmental concern have achieved what others could not. A sense of shared destiny as humankind. The climate crisis is making people realize our common destiny and the need for a unity of purpose. And that is where evidence leads, towards peace, a peace that is ecological in nature and in purpose. This is my intuition, enhanced utility for international law and greater respect for human rights could be the outcome of embracing the environmental challenge united and humankind. And let me add an extra token question in one, more one second, <laughs> three seconds. Um, Bob, new scientific and technological developments related to biology, let's say biotechnology, cloning, gene editing, CRISPR-Cas9, transhumanism, and the like, will put everything we know and do regarding human rights on trial. Where can we find, where can we look for answers in this brave new world? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Raul. So last but not least, we have Javier over Zoom.
I think that you're muted. Or can anybody help us with this? Hello? Can yeah. you hear me now? Right, yes. Hello, good morning or good afternoon, European time. I'm speaking to you from The Hague, from my office where I work on a daily basis, which is at the office of the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. Thank you very much for the invitation. It is a pleasure, it is a privilege and honor to join you uh, today and to do this homage essentially to our very dear Professor uh, Johansen. I feel just like my colleagues mentioned deeply in, in depth with, with Bob from everything that I learned now almost 30 years ago. I graduated in 1995 and everything that I, my experience in Notre Dame with Bob and with the Institute was deeply educational for sure. I learned a lot. It was also deeply uh, inspiring and it was also, by the way, very important for as a network to learn about many contexts and many uh, opportunities. So it was actually the experience in Notre Dame that led me to The Hague, to where I work and now. I moved to The Hague 25 years ago. First, I worked for seven years for the Tribunal, International Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia, and now it's, 20, uh, excuse me, 18 years for the International Criminal Court, and I carry with me all the inspiration and all the learning that I gained uh, in Notre Dame at many different levels, from the courses on international institutions, of course, to, for example, uh, definitely a, a conflict resolution and models such as getting to yes, that I keep using today for my work, because our work rests very much in diplomatic skills and cooperation from states and agencies and witnesses and people from all um, over the world and many other skills and knowledge that I gained in, uh, in Notre Dame. To the question of whether the evidence uh, leads in the right direction to greater peace and respect for human rights, I can only answer in the positive, very much in agreement with the main thesis in Bob's uh, book. Here is the evidence. This building is, is the evidence, the building of the International Criminal Court. I'm sitting every day, I sit here uh, in the office, uh, in the premises of the Metodal Prosecutor. If you can see this tower behind me, that's the courtroom uh, right there. So that's where we are conducting uh, currently uh, at this stage right now, uh, four trials and where we receive the victims to speak and tell their stories of suffering resulting for so many uh, forms of war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, involving rapes, mass killings, torture, uh, et cetera, et cetera. When we were in Notre Dame, it was unthinkable that something like this could be uh, established. It was already a great surprise and achievement to establish the Yugoslavia Tribunal, and in parallel also the Rwanda Tribunal sponsored by the UN. That was already a, a big uh, achievement. And going beyond that and having a permanent uh, a court for the whole world was something uh, unthinkable. And yet, beyond the most uh, optimistic uh, expectations, yes, a, a number of enlightened people and countries in the world agreed to establish the International Criminal Court in 1998. And a few years later, only four years later, which is very fast for international law, the court started working in July uh, 2002. I joined shortly afterwards in 2004. And I remember when I left the Yugoslavia tribunal, my colleagues kindly organized some farewell drinks. And uh, I took the floor to say, thank you very much. I'm moving to the ICC, but there is no guarantee that this will succeed because this is just so difficult at so many levels insufficient resources, insufficient cooperation, uh, hellish operational conditions that we may as well uh, uh, fail. So please, if you don't mind my friends, can you do you mind to keep this job for me in ICTY? Because I might be knocking back in your door in a few months and, and rushing back to ICTY. I was saying uh, jokingly, but that was really the situation. There was no warranty that the ICC could uh, succeed, right? So in the meantime, indeed, 123 states joined uh, the ICC, which is, shall we say, in the range of 65% of the total number of states in the world, and possibly about 50% of the world population, which means the majority of the states, but about only half of the population, because many big states have not ratified yet uh, the ICC. 
So yes, beyond the most optimistic expectations, we succeeded to establish the SEC and to keep it working and deliver justice as much as we can, subject to the available evidence for so many cases um, around the world, right? So um, uh, Bob's book actually, refer I've enjoyed a lot reading the book. Thank you very much for, 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 the, uh, for the book, uh, Bob. And I enjoyed, of course, especially the references. There are many references to international justice and to the ICC. The first thing that I have to say is congratulations for the very good research skills that, show, that Bob shows in the book. All the account of the history and the developments of the ICC international justice is actually very accurate. That's exactly how things have uh, unfolded uh, over the recent uh, uh, decades. And secondly, of course, and beyond the accurate and uh, account and narrative, there is a very sharp analysis on why this is fundamental, basically for the survival of the planet and, and, and humanity. As Bob explains correctly, in the development of modern states, a critical step is to reach a point in which the rule of law prevails over the rule of violence. Thinking about my part of the world in Europe up to the say, 14th century or so in the Middle Ages, wars between villages were very common. They had a, a, a conflict between village A and village B and the consequence was immediately raids and, uh, and mass looting and massacres and so on at the village level. And then by the Middle Ages, luckily, luckily there is a consensus that that's not a good idea to keep killing each other between villages and then they establish some communities and some uh, provinces and then some states and they achieve peace uh, at that level of, of, of aggregation, which is a fundamental precondition to achieve development, to, to achieve wealth and well-being for those communities. And as Bob uh, correctly states uh, in a historical perspective, this is the only way forward for the world as a whole to basically um, accept that such wars and violence between the states is unacceptable. And the only way to achieve greater development and, and welfare is through a fundamental commitment uh, to world peace uh, for sure. And definitely the rule of law, international justice is indispensable uh, in that direction. So that's where the evidence uh, lead. By the way, my work, I like very much, I like very much the title of the book because my work is all about evidence. That's what I do on a daily basis. I collect evidence, analyze evidence, and present it to the judges. It's, it's all a world of uh, evidence uh, uh, over here. And then what we have to say is that, well, this is not going to be a straightforward uh, road for sure. As uh, Mahatma Gandhi used to say, there is no way to climb the Himalayas in a straight line, right? If you want to reach those high uh, altitudes, you're going to need to, you have to be prepared for a bumpy uh, road for ups and downs and a lot of, uh, a lot of work and uh, a lot of um, effort. It takes a lot of work, by the way, for me and many of my colleagues on a daily basis to process and analyze and understand thousands over thousands of pages of evidence and to go on mission long uh, complex missions and meet uh, witnesses and victims in all uh, places uh, on earth and put together the cases complex cases for for the judges it is a lot of work it's heavy work but it's work that we can uh, keep carrying on because we have the inspirations of great minds great researchers and leaders such as uh, Bob Johansson. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Javier. So I would like to invite Professor Johansson to address the questions and comments that our speakers have already raised. Hello, Shabi. Hello, Bob. How are you doing? <laughs> um, all of the panelists, Isis, Raul, and Shabi, have raised excellent questions and made excellent comments. And so I really, I mean, the best thing I could do would probably yield my time for them to say something more because I feel they have more to say. And uh, in a way, they have much more uh, capacity to express it well today than I do anymore. But let me try my best to briefly address these
questions and then uh, keep, keep myself a little briefer than I did in the first uh, session. Um, I, don't, I, I can't in a specific way respond to everything that ISA, ISIS addressed, uh, but simply to say I think that my approach to these questions is heavily influenced, as I said this morning, by the capabilities approach to economic development of Amartya Sen's. This is an approach in which every human being is seen as worthy of developing his or her potential to the full level of his or her capabilities. And we need nationally and globally to give high respect to that approach for every human being. Um, this idea of freedom to achieve well-being should be given primary moral significance. And the well-being that we should promote should be connected with people's capabilities and functionings. And that, that's what defines what we do. I don't think there's any existing instrument of international law or philosophy or religion that may encompass things in quite that way. But th that is the approach that I would recommend, at least to the extent it's possible to implement it. <clears throat> Raul has asked um, questions, especially at the end, that I am incapable of answering, such as how will bioengineering be encompassed in a new vision of world uh, governance? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I do believe that the way, the path to find how to address that is to consult those who are involved in it and those who are affected by it. And that's why one of the correlates of peace that I emphasize so much is the democratization of political decision making from the local to the global level. Right now we have a huge democratic deficit at the global level. Unfortunately, those deficits are, are increasing in many national contexts, including uh, in some ways in the United States, but I don't have time to go into how to address those. My answer is affirmative to his questions. Should we have an international environmental court? Because other courts aren't taking up those issues. If we could, we should, yes. I, my guess is that would grow out of first a more uh, elaborate uh, fabric of international law govern, governing environmental issues. Um, but we need those global uh, decision makers that Ra Raul has suggested. He's also pointing a finger of hope to the prospect that environmental issues will draw us together. And it's true that they illustrate very well the sense in which the human species has a common destiny. That part's there. However, some of our optimism about that has been quashed by the realization that the consequences of environmental problems are not equally distributed. And so it is that there's this desire to export my environmental problem over to your part of the world. This happens domestically as people of color or people of poverty in the United States, for example, are much more likely to suffer environmental consequences than others. Same thing is true globally. Where possible, wealthy countries export their waste to poor countries who are willing to accept it for a price. So the inequity consequences of environmental issues have fragmented the possibility of bringing us all together. Now, they haven't fragmented it permanently, but all I'm saying is this: one of the correlates of peace is equity, and we have to give much more attention to equity and reciprocity as we think about how to solve environmental problems in order for us to see the way in which the global uh, issues do draw us together. Uh, Shabi's very generous comments about uh, his time here 
I want to simply comment on in this respect. I have learned more from the students I have had in my classes than from any other single place, I believe, in my years of study. So the students, the perspectives they bring, the knowledge they have is so important and it's, it's what makes me feel very confident that one of the keys to improving the world and leaving it better than we found it is listening carefully to what one another has to say. I remember one of the first times, it wasn't at Notre Dame, it was before that, but I was involved in the World Order Models Project. <clears throat> and we had people from all cultural regions of the world present talking about how should the world be organized in order to reduce human suffering. And after a couple of days, one of the people who I hadn't met asked to see me, uh, to talk to me, and which I was happy to meet him and talk with him. And he couldn't believe that I was from the United States. He said, it isn't common to have US citizens that sit and listen very much. <laughs> now, I'm not mentioning that to sort of puff up my own ego, but to make it clear that it is so difficult for people of advantage who've had privileges not to think that somehow they are superior to or that they don't have to listen to people who have had far fewer opportunities. Let me just assure everyone here that um, talent is spread much more evenly around the world than opportunity. And those of us who've had a lot of opportunities need to keep reminding ourselves and one another of that. The path away from the world that we now face of great possibility of suffering and devastation will go through the ability to listen carefully to one another and to take seriously what each other says. I, of course, agree with Shabi that the International Criminal Court represents a huge step forward. First time in world history, all of world history, that we've had an international, we've had an institution that isn't committed to a single ethnic group that is set up purposely to look at how individuals, not states, but how individuals carry out their human conduct, especially on the grossest of human rights violations like genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. And this court even has the possibility, if the members will take it, of looking at the question of aggressive war. But this is the way forward in order to reduce human suffering. It's to hold individual people accountable for what they do. There's a lot of evidence that enforcing law, though it's not perfect, it does tend to deter wrongdoing. And the fact that the whole world has endorsed this statute, even though some countries like the United States, India, China, Soviet Union, haven't, uh, Russia. It's also true that there are two, two members of the, permanent members of the Security Council, France and the United Kingdom, that did endorse that statute. That also illustrates the possibility that even great powers might see the wisdom of law enforced on individuals. Now, I'm under no illusions the, the constellation that brought together the capability of writing the Rome Statute and ratifying it may not be present now. It's possible we couldn't do it now if the issue came up. But it has happened, and if we give it support, it will enable us, I think, to reduce human suffering in the long run. So again, I want to thank the panelists very much for your comments and, and the chair for uh, presiding over this, so I look forward to respond to comments from the audience. Thank you so much, Professor Johansen. So now the floor is open for questions, remarks, comments. Do we have a mic?
Thank you. Yeah. I have just uh, some comments that I would like to share with you, and probably I will raise a question for Bob here. Uh, I mean, uh, I believe, you know, um, Bob men mentioned, Bob Johansson mentioned the ongoing conflict is uh, harming democracy, which creates more democratic deficit. Uh, the evidence leads to an outcome of long process that is harming democracies. And these are things that, uh, you know, the ongoing situation based on the panelists that they try to explain, whether from environmental, from the international law, or from, you know, even grassroots or, you know, uh, uh, let's say, perspectives. And back to the speaking to uh, where we go, you know, do we need to speak to the policymakers? And we have lots of conflicts around us. Uh, one of them probably, uh, I, I would raise the question of the Palestine-Israel conflict and now the ongoing Russia and Ukraine conflict, speaking to the policymakers or to the civil society and international agencies and uh, or to the people here, uh, then where to go? I wonder if you could emphasize on with whom to speak, where we start. And here I will quote based on the panelists and the previous even panel. Do we need to speak to the soldiers, to the army? Do we need to speak to the civil society or to the state? Or uh, do we have to speak to the main players, which on my opinion here, if we take the, for example, the Russian-Ukraine conflict, uh, U.S. and its alliances, the European NATO alliances that consist of 30, 30 independent members countries, or, or that's the question, are we relying on self-destruction of the Russian, for example, with this conflict, Russian players, Putin himself, or Russian army, or what? Here, in my opinion, the state versus civil society and democracy, where we have to go. These are my questions, you know. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other questions from the audience? Lisa, over here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bob. It's a great event. Thank you. Um, for such a brilliant panel this morning and this one as well. I'm afraid I've not read the book yet, so I suspect the answer to this question is likely to be in the book. Um, I wanted to push the panel a little bit on your last point when you were talking about how right now if we were to try and get a conf configuration together to put the ICC out there, it, it likely isn't going to happen, right? Um, and in a sense, so Stephen Hopgood's written a really interesting book, The End Times of Human Rights, right, where he's basically questioning the fact that today uh, human rights isn't a global norm, if of course it ever had been in the first place. And today we have so many states flouting international human rights law, flouting international humanitarian law, uh, on the one hand, in the north and in the south, right, obviously. And on the other hand, the fact is that the human rights framework, as it has been, has always been linked very much or contingent upon a kind of colonial vision of human rights and so on. We all know the arguments. And so I guess I remember naively thinking when we were preparing the evidence for the genocide trial in Guatemala against Guatemala's former uh, dictator, Efrain Rios Montt, with Paul Seals, Javier, probably a, a former colleague of you, yours at the ICC, um, I remember naively thinking that most Guatemalans, right, not the military, not the police, not people linked to the economic elites, but most Guatemalans would be behind an initiative to hold perpetrators of mass human rights atrocities to account. But of course they weren't, right? And similar things are going on, as you all know very well, in Colombia. So I guess I wanted to push a little bit around how we start thinking that in such a context like today, things aren't irreversible. On the contrary, right? What we've seen is a massive deterioration in human rights protection and guarantees, not since 9-11 necessarily. It's always been there, right? Um, but there's been an empowerment of the, the <coughs> naysayers, if you like. What is today's environment? Which challenges particularly does today's environment hold for us in that regard? 
Thank you so much. Any other questions? Over here. We have another question. Over there. I have a question about courts. Uh, there's a fondness to or a attraction to creating courts, international courts. Um, and my question is really not around courts, I guess, it's around the alternatives to courts. And I ask, what are the alternatives to courts to getting to human security? Because uh, courts are constrained. Courts are retrospective. They can only see disputes and genocide after they've occurred, not before uh, they've occurred. Courts. Uh, offer zero-sum solutions of winners and losers, uh, which, harms, which can harm relationships, uh, not allow them to develop over time. In international law, of course, courts are constrained um, by the realities of state sovereignty. So courts are you know, highly problematic, really constrained. They speak this narrow language of rights that most people kind of want to grab onto, but doesn't make sense to a lot of people because it is a very narrow language. Um, and I, I say this as someone who's trained as a lawyer. I think lawyers, I, I, what is it like? You have a hammer and every problem looks like a nail. Uh, and so, and, and I know Raul, you talked about, you know, creating an international environmental court. But then I, I sort of get frustrated, like courts are super constrained at solving the world's problems. Um, and we see this in the United States, we see this in courts in other countries, constitutional courts, very constrained entities uh, for the reasons I mentioned and many others. So what are some of the things we can do prospectively rather than retrospectively to get to human security um, so that we don't have to get to courts. Thank you so much. I think that we have also a question from Raul. Yeah. Uh, my question is for Xavier. Um, do you think uh, in the foreseeable future we're gonna have that the ICC will include international environmental crimes? Thank you. Are there any other questions? Otherwise, we can turn the floor to the speakers and Professor Johansson. There is another question over here. Thank you. Um, probably in the same in the same way, um, thinking about the environmental issues and the gap between international institutions and, and, and the necessity that the local responses to environmental issues. What is, what is, what will be thinking about international institutions for environmental rights, like probably courts, probably <laughs> policy makers that Raul mentioned. Uh, the, the question will be how can you, how we can connect these global initiatives with local initiatives. I, I have been here and seeing how we, at individual level, we don't have good practices. At individual level, I, I see the difference. Um, I came two weeks ago from, from the UK and see the differences that we have every day with very simple things. Uh, so this is local, and local is individual level, but subnational level, but national level. How we can connect this in really discussion, global discussion about environment with our culture? with our way to do the things in practice. And it's not only, and it's, it's just, it's probably it's not a problem of courts, but it's a problem of just our day to day. Thank you so much for that question. So does any of the panelists or Professor Johansson want to address the questions? Not really address the questions, I just have four connections I want to try to make, and I think <laughs> they address the questions um, indirectly. Um, I want to talk about modeling and the importance of modeling uh, when thinking about connection between the local and the global, or between the individual and, and state. Um, if countries behave differently, they send a very different message. And here I want to talk from my location in the United States. Um, if the double standards are not held, if there is more accountability in thinking about consequences of actions, um, the whole human rights uh, framework, I think we need to be very careful 
and how we use it. Because if it comes from a position of imposition, uh, from a position of, um, of frameworks that are only based on Western liberal thought, people are not going to connect with it. If it comes from uh, below, where people have the chance actually to develop it and take um, um, agency and control over how to frame it, that's really important. Uh, I want to close by um, getting us to think differently about agency as well and the people um, we write about or work with. Um, and. Bina talked uh, briefly about this in the morning, um, and I do focus on that in my own work, thinking about narratives. And um, when I um, think about the work I've been doing with uh, Palestinian and Syrian refugees in Germany for the last seven years, I mean, these people literally challenged a whole world system that ignored them, right? Europe that closed its borders, and they called the journey a journey of death. You either make it or not. It's a 50-50 chance. And with their feet, right, they were challenging. So how are we to think about these challenges, right? How are we to incorporate it into a system that ignores, that marginalizes, that erases the suffering of so many of this world? These are, the, so lots of them are connected when we think about agency, accountability, modeling uh, within a larger framework of rights. I think it's the implementation that matters. And this is why I go back to the question I raised earlier. Uh, we don't have time. Um, I mean, even if we don't only focus on environmental, the suffering in the world, uh, Bob's book talks about um, inequalities, the advantages with technology, but how we're using it to advance one group over another. I mean, these are issues that we still can change, but if we don't, it might be too late. So thank you. I'm not very optimistic this morning, but the work I do does not yeah, render exactly. me to be optimistic. Um, and I'm not here to, yeah. you know, um, paint a, a rosy picture. I mean, the amount of suffering is unbearable that people go through. And it's something we need to <coughs> center in our work and also in how we address these issues. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to be bold and to take some risk in this part of my presentation. If we want to, to reflect upon current challenges to human rights all over the world, I'd suggest we should look to works of fiction rather than, um, for, I mean, we all have read this very likely several times, but uh, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, 1984 by George Orwell, and Oryx and Craig by Margaret Atwood. I think the three of them taken together and that would be the, the, the extra value here, um, would picture, according to me, um, a pretty accurate uh, idea of what the world is becoming or is coming to be. In the, uh, not in the, these are books who were understood as science fiction. Um, skip the fiction part, and, uh, and I don't know, it's the world we are living now. And, um, and there are several reflections you, we can get out of these books, and many others, of course, there are hundreds, that could help us to, to think about it. But, but what we need, uh, it's a new ethics, a new bioethics, because, because you are right. I mean, and, and you are right. I mean, we, we may have thousand international court, environmental courts, or court of justice, or penal courts, or whatever. But if we don't change ourselves, our our and I'm and I'm risking being too naive, but but I really believe uh, a new ethic is is needed, a bioethics for our times. And and I think there are a lot of people who can help on us. There is a Chilean, Godofredo Stutzin. I think he's a pioneer of these ideas of our relationship with nature and animals and other beings. And, and there are some, some Americans like Aldo Leopold, Rachel Carson, uh, Europeans like Hans Jonas, and, um, and there are two priests, two Catholic priests actually, the, the American uh, Thomas Berry, I think uh, his books, Dream of the Earth and others, are particularly important to this uh, conversation. And, 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 um, and the person who inspired Thomas Berry, the French uh, a Jesuit, the uh, du Chardin, uh, it's also relevant in this conversation. Uh, th th these are just open ideas if 
one of you take one of these books or these ideas, I would feel extremely uh, satisfied. Thank you. Thank you so much. Javier, do you want to add something or answer any of the questions? Yes, thank you very much for all these very good uh, questions. I will go back to a very important point that Bob made, which is the importance of uh, listening. This is actually so fundamental and it comes to my mind very, very often at many different levels in my work when dealing with victims and witnesses, uh, of course, and at um, every level of uh, our life. If we have questions about Russia, for example, as we heard the first uh, uh, question from my former colleague, by the way, uh, we studied together in 1995. Frankly, we need to ask or share this question with uh, Russians. There is a, a fair number of former uh, Russian graduates from, from the program. I would be very curious to hear from our Russian colleagues what do they think about this terrible situation that they are going through uh, uh, these days, right? If we have complex questions about justice, which of course I have heard in the questions and I hear very often, I have many uh, such critical questions all the time for many years now. I think that we should look at that in a, in a, with some introspection as well, right? A test that I use very often is simply to represent that question in my own national and personal uh, background, right? My father fought in the Spanish Civil War towards the end of the war, that is 1939. In the province where he came from, this is Navarre in Spain, uh, approximately 3,000 people were killed in about two months, August, September 1936. He was part of the troops that were basically in the killing site. He was drafted and he joined the troops with General Franco. General Mola was the person who commanded the troops that killed about 3,000 people only in this province. So when I have these debates, I ask myself, would it would have been, would have it been a good idea to have an investigation and a trial of General Mola for these thousands of killings? I take a moment to think about that and represent that situation. And the only possible answer for that is yes, absolutely so. It is such a scandal that thousands over thousands of people were shot dead in the 1930s and 40s uh, in Spain, that justice is absolutely unavoidable. It is not the only answer, it's not a perfect answer, but it's an absolutely indispensable uh, answer because victims have the right, a fundamental right to justice uh, and truth. In, and because societies cannot move on in, in any good direction without addressing that uh, uh, violence, right? Uh, I heard a question about uh, Guatemala including uh, Paul Seals, which is not only a former colleague, it's actually a good friend, and actually organized by Paul. Uh, we had a training uh, program for Guatemalan prosecutors and judges already uh, 20 years ago, and I had the pleasure to contribute to that and contribute to the uh, training for those uh, national uh, actors. So uh, that was a very good experience, and as those who know Guatemala will, will know, it was a complex scenario. Uh, after in the, in the beginning, this is 20 years ago, it was again unthinkable that any such trial or prosecutions could take place. Then there was a trial, and you may remember the trial of General uh, Rios Mont that led to a conviction, and then it was quashed and so on, complex uh, a story. Uh, and then there's a new wave of trials, those who follow the, in Guatemala will know that, entirely led uh, by uh, national prosecutors who are doing a very a lot of very good work in investigating and prosecuting those uh, uh, massacres. So in the perspective of 20 or 25 years, the news from Guatemala in that sense, I believe are good and they will sort of confirm Bob's main thesis that there is hope that can be done. And if we are persistent and we work hard, there can be progress and that's only first the fundamental right for the victims and also the best way for the development um, of the country. It was uh, Miguel Angel Asturias, the, the Guatemalan uh, author, literature Nobel Prize, who said many years ago, los ojos de los muertos no se cerrarán hasta que llegue el día de la justicia. The eyes of the dead people cannot close until the day of justice arrives because that is what happens. The crimes are so horrible that are genuinely unforgettable. The memory of the violence doesn't go away 
and the eyes of those dead people, killed people anywhere on earth will only shut down when the day of justice arrives. Thank you so much, Javier. And Professor Johansson, do you want to add something or any final remarks? Uh, we don't have a lot of time. I can... Do it two or three minutes. Right. Okay. <laughs> let, let, me, let me just make one comment. I, I value very much the re other responses and questions that may not have been answered here, but I just want to comment a little further on Mark's question about why always create courts and think about courts and go to courts when they're really pretty limited and they often are very sort of dualistic in their thinking, which is not a very sophisticated way to understand reality. <clears throat> and here is my brief answer. Um, courts are far from a perfect instrument for dealing with serious conflicts. But deficient though they are, usually a court decision is far superior to fighting a war to resolve the same dispute, if that's the only remaining alternative. And sometimes that may be the only remaining alternative. I'd like to think about a whole series of processes or mechanisms for dealing with serious conflicts. When there are serious conflicts between large groups of people about the best instrument that humanity has found for handling those is through some rule of law process. Now that's often inadequate, but it is better than fighting. Take the Nuremberg precedent right after World War II. The Nuremberg precedent, I think, was extremely valuable, although it was clearly flawed justice. It was victor's justice over the vanquished. The Germans were being tried by the victors in World War II. But yet that precedent, I think, was still very valuable because it established the idea that individual political leaders are responsible. They're responsible as individuals. And the idea that, oh, I'm acting on behalf of the state, that cannot be a legitimate defense in this trial. Did that individual violate uh, laws? If the answer is yes, that, has to be, that can be established through investigation and bringing of evidence. And though it was, it was a flawed justice, the precedent was very important. It took a half century before humanity ever followed up on that in the uh, ad hoc tribunal for the former Yugoslavia that Shabi was part of. But still, though that was not a perfect judicial system, that too, I think, was valuable. And that tribunal and the Rwandan tribunal paved the way for creating the permanent International Criminal Court. So while it is not a fully satisfactory approach. It's better than fighting, and it does try to clarify the truth about these issues in a very narrowly structured legal process. But it is better always if you can avoid not only war, but avoid going to court. Always, or nearly always, better. <laughs> but the virtue of the court, again, is if you ever reach an agreement, it's more likely to be reliably uh, honored. If you have a court you can appeal to if another party to a contract doesn't, um, doesn't agree to it. So uh, all I'm saying is it's, it's one of many instruments. And I'd like to think of it as the next step beyond fighting, beyond having wars. We're going to put political leaders uh, on trial if they misbehave. And you know I'm not interested in. Obviously, I'm not interested in capital punishment. I'm not going to kill them. I'm not interested even in having them in prison all their lives. I'd just like to deprive a political leader who's committed a war crime or genocide never again to be able to exercise political power 
or certainly military power, the power of violence. But we, ha there, we, we have a lot to learn, let's say, in, from African traditions of how to deal with conflicts in ways that avoid courts. There are many, many good ways to think about achieving a greater degree of justice than you can get out of a court. And we should certainly look to those, Mark. You're absolutely right. We should look to those and try to enable ourselves to avoid the conflicts that don't even take us to court. But if I have to choose between a war or a court decision, I'm probably, in most cases, going to opt for the court decision. So if we see this in perspective and in context, uh, we understand we're not just trying to put people in prison, and we're not just trying to race for a, an, a yes or no, up or down uh, conviction of guilt. Uh, that's sort of a last resort, but it's better than what might be coming if we don't do that. Thank you. Thank you. So since we are short in time, I may close this panel session by thanking Isis and Raul Javier for having accepted this invitation to participate in the panel and also congratulating Professor Johansen for this book. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs>